A lot of us feel a lot of pressure because we want to excel at everything. And a lot of people get disconnected from what is truly is important for them. In a situation like this, how can people find that balance? It's really about approaching things in two different ways, sort of the big picture strategic, but also the mm -hmm. here and moment tactical. What I go back to is this idea that we're human beings. We're not human doings. We're not human achieving. The way I look at it is that no matter what goal you have, it's not achieving the goal that is the product is you the person that you're becoming is the product if that's the goal where do i need to be 10 years from now now we can start to live a life that is really going to be the one we look back on and say yeah i lived a good life in fact because when you take anything and expand it over a long horizon of time then you realize that most of the things you said or the way you reacted didn't really align with what you truly want to be Welcome to the Shift with CJ podcast. In the Shift with CJ podcast, I love going into deeper science, health, wellness, but most importantly, how can we find better models to live with? Now, we're all stressed. Life can be a bit crazy sometimes. And in these times, we need to get some good advice for us to just keep sane and keep balanced because when you're in balance, life is good. And for that, Today, I have the honor of having Dr. Jonathan Marion. Dr. Marion is amazing. He's a cultural anthropology professor. He's an author. He's a transformative life coach. He has helped people find more deep meanings in their lives and help them make their lives more fulfilling. And he's only done this for 20 years. <laughs> so... Dr. Jonathan brings this unique blend of wisdom with, um, you know, positive psychology, different disciplines, emotional intelligence. And, um, and yeah, so I'm super excited. Dr. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, CJ. I'm glad to have you. I was super excited, actually, because uh, like I mentioned, you know, we speak a lot about biohacking and wellness, but every time I speak to people about like the deeper things about life, about its meaning, about things we can do, these are the conversations that really touch my heart. And every time I speak to our listeners as well, they get more out of that than some, you know, biochemistry, cell biology stuff. So I'm super excited. Now, um. I want to start with this. Like I mentioned, a lot of us feel a lot of pressure, me including, because we want to we want to excel at everything. We want to excel at our careers. We want to excel at our social lives. We also want to juggle all of these family responsibilities. And most of us have this fear that we're missing out. And because of this fear of missing out and because of all of this, a lot of people get disconnected from what is truly is important for them. So in a situation like this, how can people find that balance to kind of like look at all of these multiple things and juggle them all together? Yeah, so that's obviously not an easy question. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's really about approaching things in two different ways, sort of the big picture strategic, but also the mm -hmm. here and the moment tactical. And so the strategic one, what I go back to is this idea that we're human beings. We're not human doings. We're not human achievings. And so how can I be the person I want to be? How can I be the type of person that is what ultimately is the most rewarding, meaningful, fulfilling for me? And so I like to use being as the acronym. And so the B is for begin where you are. Because I think all too often, we, when we know something's not satisfying, we're just looking for changes, but we don't actually stop and assess what is the current situation. Yes, there are constraints, but there are also opportunities. What are the strengths, skills, backgrounds that I actually have available? And if you just think about trying to go anywhere you know, in your car, you know, whether it's on your phone or the GPS in the car, it needs a signal to know where it is first. It can't navigate to a destination without starting where it is. And so I think that's the first step. Mm -hmm. The E is for explore where you're going. Where is it you want to go? And again, all too often, I think some of those pressures you were just talking about 
are things we internalize from society, from media, from family. And so we're looking for that promotion, that advancement, whatever it is. But is that something that's really resonant with us? What are the job skills it'll call on? What are the relating uh, dynamics that would be involved in that situation? And are those things we really want more of in our life? Are they maybe things we don't really want, but it's not that difficult and it's worth the trade-off? Or is it we're just following what we think we should do versus something that's really authentic to us? And all too often, should is fighting with what is. It's, you know, either things are that way or they're not. And so I prefer to look at it as could, right? My boss could recognize my efforts. Mm -hmm. My coworker could, you know, do their share on time. My kids could listen to me. I could go to the gym. The minute we say should, you know, okay, it happened or it didn't, but now what? When we replace that with could, we open up possibilities. And that brings me to the I in being. So B was for begin where you are, E, explore where you're going. And I is for identify your options because there's multiple ways between any two points. And I think, you know, it's great to start with brainstorming, like just what are all the possibilities? But on top of that, I think it's also really important to identify how have we each made the decisions in our own lives that have actually worked out the best, that we feel the best about, that, you know, maybe even had better outcomes than we intended. And what are the things that really haven't worked out in our favor? And so for one person, it could be a pro and con list. For another, it could be talking to friends and family who know them well. For someone else, it could be just what's a gut feeling. So first brainstorm, but then identify how have you made your best choices and then apply that to your brainstorming. N brings us to now start, because I think all too often, we get caught up in you know, perfectionism and trying to account for everything. And we can't. Life is what happens, usually while we're busy making other plans. And you know, if you really understand that you know where you are, you know where you're going, and you know why you chose to go that way, it doesn't matter if there's a detour, you're not lost. So if I'm driving home from work and there's road construction, sure, it may be a little inconvenient, but I'm not lost. Or if I'm driving home from work and I think of, oh, here's an errand I have to run. Yes, it'll take me out of my way, but it's actually more efficient to do it today than make a separate trip separately tomorrow. Okay, I'm not lost. And so just start is the only way you're going to get there. We never reach any destination when we never set out. And that brings us to the G, get your best life. And I don't mean that in a fixed sense of you've arrived and it's done, but in the sense of sometimes we're so busy pursuing something that we never actually appreciate the distance we've traveled. So this isn't, I've reached the end of my journey, but this is fine, I've hit a plateau. Let me stop and enjoy the scenery. Let me recognize what are the new experiences, skills, relationships that I've added to sort of, you know, my toolkit, to my, you know, story, and appreciate those things. So you could also look in some ways at G as gratitude and recognize what are all the things you now have available for every next step. So the strategic piece that I advise is that being strategy. That's beautiful. Actually, the way you've conveyed it, um, I'm sure all the listeners are finding it very helpful as, as well. And I encourage you to take notes. Uh, it's super interesting how you said we're the we're human beings, so we can only be. When you look at uh, the nature, you know, a lion isn't called a lion being, a zebra isn't called a zebra being. Only humans are called human beings because we have the power and the ability um, and the brain to just be. Oftentimes, we step out of it, and uh, this is why I started with the whole stress piece because you know, when you look at some of the research that is coming out from the U.S. They're saying that 76% of the population aren't uh, happy in their jobs. 83% of the population are facing extreme work-related stress. And um, it's really good that you pointed out that model because it gives people a lot of empowerment rather than, um, and this makes them take things in their own hand. As you were explaining all of this, it was like, okay, that's giving the power back to you. And oftentimes we lose that power. And then we start blaming others. We're blaming the situation, society, whatever. 
And sometimes we don't stop and realize that, hey, we've come a long way. And like you mentioned, we've gained the necessary skills, the relationship, the friendship. And the way I look at it is that no matter what goal you have, it's not achieving the goal that is the product. It's you, the person that you're becoming is the product. I wish I met you in my younger days because I was completely, you know, obsessed with all of these uh, titles and goals. In fact, there's a funny story. I remember I used to do these small uh, jobs because I would never wanted to climb the corporate ladder. Um, thank God for that at that point. And I was always do these uh, small, tiny jobs. And I would go to these parties and everyone would ask me like, hey, what do you do for a living? And at that point, I was super embarrassed to tell people like, hey, um, you know, I'm doing these odd jobs here and there. But I often wondered, what if people change the narrative of that question and ask, hey, um, what do you aspire to be in whichever career you're looking at? Or, um, you know, how can you, or or like, for example, what would be the ideal uh, thing for you in the next five years? And that's much more of an empowering question. And that also kind of brings that being thing, which is amazing what you said. Yeah, I'd actually piggyback on that and push even further. Mm -hmm. I've never heard a story of someone who at the end of their life on their deathbed is looking back and going, I wish I'd spent more time at work. I mm -hmm. wish I had acquired, you know, another promotion. Um, it's usually things about experiences they didn't have, relationships that weren't fulfilling. And so I think that if we actually start there and not just sort of, you know, what is the obituary you'd like, but if, you know, write it like a screenplay you know, who's actually at your funeral? What's the nature of it? You know, mm -hmm. what's the life that really you're going to have wanted to leave behind? Now let's reverse engineer. If that's the goal, where do I need to be 10 years from now? And to be there 10 years from now, where do I need to be five years? And if that's five years, where three years, where one year, where six months, now we can start to live a life that is really going to be the one we look back on and say, yeah, I lived a good life. And as you said, there's also this whole stress issue. And I think it's really important to recognize the human body has only one autonomic nervous system and it evolved in survival contexts. And so those are life and death. And so, you know, I encounter a big bear ancestrally and, you know, I can, you know, bonk it in the head with a rock. I can run away. I can freeze and hope it loses interest. And yeah, that's that huge surge of, you know, hormones and things that really focus me very intensely, you know, amp up my system. But once the situation's resolved, all of those hormones drain away. And the problem is that it's all of these small things like traffic, like, you know, your favorite station isn't coming in clearly, like too many people are asking you questions at the same time they're triggering this same deluge of life and death chemicals and hormones, but those little stressors, when do they ever stop? And so we keep having to deal with this over and over. And that's part of why you have such chronic stress, especially when, as you said, it's all of these external accomplishments that anything that hinders us getting closer is being registered as life and death stress in the body. I also think that uh, sometimes when you when you think all about the external, uh, the outside world is never going to go your way. Yes, you can take certain steps for it to happen, but there are thousands or maybe millions of forces, the economy, the market, how people are feeling that day, the traffic, whatever. But your internal states, if you take responsibility of it, can be completely managed by you, your mind, your body, your energy, your emotions. And if you kind of like circle back and think that, okay, I'm not going to give someone the power to disturb me internally, because no matter what happens, this is that one state that I can live with. Because the external things, like you said, so many, there are so many variables, but your internal state, if you can be the, I call it the Buddha mode. If you can get into the Buddha mode and like, just, you know, just focus on yourself. I think that's a win. But a lot of the times what happens is a lot, you know, when things are going good, it's all fine. People don't notice much. And we have this negativity bias towards life where we always notice things when they're going wrong. But once something goes wrong, it 
it seems like at least in most people's life that it triggers a chain of reaction of these bad events. And um, think about like multiple deadlines at work, commitments, and a lot of these crazy things happening. So when people get to this overwhelmed state and you touched upon this briefly, is there anything else that they should kind of um, do or think about when, you know, where there are so many people asking them for questions and, you know, at the same time, there are multiple emails firing. So what do you see or what have you um, come across which has helped someone? Yeah, so I think there are several pieces here. Uh, one that we already mentioned is just shifting from should to could. Mm -hmm. because either things happened or they didn't. And now what do you want to do? And so that's giving agency back. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one is, I think, recognizing the difference between responsibility and blame. So mm -hmm. blame is just about finding fault, but it's an ending point. Okay, now you have someone to blame. So what? It doesn't help in any way. And so I think about where's the responsibility. And so if I'm driving to pick my kids up from school and you know there's a traffic accident and I can't get through, I'm not to blame, but if I'm like, oh, I can't get through, let me go home and watch TV and I just leave them there, that's not okay. Like mm -hmm. I still have a responsibility to account for it. And so I think rather than looking at whose fault is this, just where's the responsibility? And it gives mm -hmm. people, whether it's ourselves, like I messed up and now it's my responsibility to address it or someone else you know, didn't come through I give them the chance to find a way to repair or advance whatever, you know, whether it's the relationship, the, you know, business agenda, and then they do or they don't, and I can go from there. The next, you know, sort of uh, dynamic of that is I think the difference between interest and intention. I can have intentions for myself, and I'll come back to this in a minute. And we should, you know, we should be acting intentionally, not just out of inertia or, uh, you know, the things we sort of have fallen into without really being critical about it. But I can't have an intention for how someone else is going to respond. Because as you said, people do things for lots of reasons. There's lots of forces. And so I need to show up the way I want to show up and be interested to see where someone else is coming from. If we're having a conversation and I ask a question or give an answer, but with an intention of what that's going to make you do next, that's not a conversation. I'm trying to control someone. I'm not really relating to them. I'm not really engaging with them. So I can have an intention for myself, but I should just have an interest in where that other person is. And then we can relate really authentically. And the thing I would come back to is it's the tactical piece. So the being strategy was my strategic one. The tactical piece is I can always ask the question, how do I want to be? So in this moment, with these stressors, with all of these different competing pressures, with high emotions, how do I want to show up? And I always have control over that. And that's not to say that I'm not upset. It's not to say that I'm necessarily, you know, able to respond in the same way as when I'm calm and everything's good. But I can always ask myself, you know, wait a minute, how is it that I want to be in this situation? And the extreme version of that is what I call future casting. When I'm really overwhelmed, I just try and step back and go, okay, five years from now, what am I going to have wanted to have said or done in this situation? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Future casting, that's, um, that's a good thing uh, we should all be doing. In fact, because when you take anything and expand it over a long horizon on time, then you realize that most of the things you said or the way you reacted didn't really align with what you truly want to be. In fact, I have this exercise where I kind of um, think of myself as uh, my the number that I want to live till, hopefully, is 150. So I'm looking at my 150-year-old self, and I often ask him for advices or questions because a lot of the times, if you can imagine, like, in a way, you already, if you are like above 30 or something, you already have all the wisdom in the world. You already have most of the experiences in the world. It's just that you're not able to relate to them. And once you, and we all know that we're always good at giving someone else an advice rather than acting on the advice ourselves. So this way, I just ask someone who's much more experienced than me. Um, maybe I should give it a name, but you have a cool one, future casting. Uh, that's good. Five-year one. 
I'll try that today. Now, what does the role of cultural diversity play in all of this? Now, I live in Dubai. Uh, Emirates Airlines is, Dubai is the home of Emirates Airlines, and they have 3,600 flights per week. They carry about 50 to 60 million people every time. The world is getting smaller and smaller. You go around the world. I think um, United Nations once said that in 2020, there were 1.5 billion people traveling. So you're going to run in front of people that are from a different culture. You're going to work with them. They're going to be around. And maybe your way of dealing with things and your approach of things is not going to work. So, and you know, you've studied this for a very long time. So how does like culture come into play or what do we with this new world where everyone's everywhere what are some of the things that we should look for yeah i really appreciate the question and i think the first piece of it is if we look at the natural world biodiversity just exists and one of the things that we've seen over time is that it's actually species that have plasticity, that can adapt, that survive long-term, not the ones that are overly specialized. Because if you're super specialized, great, you fit into your niche exactly as it is, but what happens the minute that something changes, whether it's the climate, whether it's another species entering? And so I think if we, rather than looking at it as needing to accommodate um, you know, people who may be don't think the way we do or have different values. It's about, wait, how can I be the most adaptable myself and therefore thrive across the most varieties? It's a starting point. And I think one of the keys here is what I talk about is sort of cultural logic because no one on the planet wakes up in the morning and goes, this makes no sense. I'm going to go do it. No one. Everyone is logical. Everyone is equally logical. It's just that what makes sense to them from what they're aware of in their framework might be very different from someone who grew up with a different framework. And so if instead of approaching things with that very sort of almost accusatory, how could you think that? I have genuine curiosity and I'm focusing on the how. How is it that you think that? Because I trust that it is fully logical. Now I have the possibility of starting to understand where you're coming from. And, you know, you'd mentioned the negativity bias. One of the other things is the human brain looks for patterns, but what do I do with that pattern? Do I look at it as, okay, I recognize something about someone and therefore I think I know about them. Well, now I fall and pray to a stereotype. Or do I say, oh, I noticed something about them, which gives me ideas about what else might be relevant. Now it's a generalization. Now I can go, okay, you know, I used to teach a class on culture and medicine for nurses, pre-med students, things like that. So if I recognize, you know, a patient is from a particular religious background, instead of knowing, oh, okay, I found out their religion. Now I know what they're like. It's, oh, I saw in your chart, this is your background. Are there any things about holidays or diets that are important for you, now I've opened up a conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I try and work from the Jedi framework. Again, I grew up with Star Wars when I was young. Yeah. And so J is for justice, right? Because if it's not about living in a just society and treating people um, fairly, I don't know why we're even talking about any of the rest of it. The E is for equity. And um, just for people who aren't familiar, I think there's a difference between equality and equity. Equality is saying we're giving everyone a bike and we give everyone the exact same model. Equity is saying I'm going to give a bike that's a very different size to, you know, a kid who's three and a half feet tall versus an athlete who's six and a half feet tall. It's which one fits you. But it's so that everyone can actually have equal access, but we're not just treating everyone as if they're identical because we're not. There is diversity. The D is for diversity, and it's just recognizing that it exists. And if we really approach everyone as an individual and, you know, fully intelligent, logical, reasonable from their own perspective, then we can actually start to include people. And so that's the I. So that's sort of the Jedi framework I try and work with. And then you asked that question of how do we actually approach people and how do we work, you know, with them? And so 
again, maybe not including some of the later prequel sequels, but at least the version of the Jedi I grew up with, you know, they were defenders of what was, you know, right and just and fair, but their number one tool and skill was using the force. And so again, I'll use that as an acronym. You may have picked up on it. I like acronyms. Mm -hmm. um, and so F is for just framework. And so if rather than approaching things as this is how I think about it and it's right, part of my cultural anthropology background is recognizing that people think about lots of things, all of which makes sense from whatever background they have, and none of them are inherently any better than any others. Well, what's your framework? Where is it that you're coming from? What's that worldview? So I can always try and figure out what's the framework. I can then shift to the optics of it. So if that's your framework, what does the world look like to you? What does this situation look like to you? What is this particular uh, engagement, conversation, business deal? What does that actually look like from that framework? Then it's a chance to pitch that out to you and to sort of review it and have a chance to reflect on it. Okay, if this is your framework, if this is what the world looks like, then what actually does make sense and why does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But again, because we're relating to other human beings, now it's a chance to clarify and correct, saying, okay, I think I understand, but I'm going to pitch it back. I'm going to say, okay, I think this is where you're coming from. I think this is the logic. Do I have that right? What is it that I may be missing? Because I'm not taking for granted I'm right. And once we've done there, we can get to the E. Okay, now we can explore what's really possible here. That's interesting. You know, I never thought of it that way, that um, the cultural logic piece has really hit me in like different centers of my brain that most of us, we always take it for granted that we are right and we understand much more because of certain worldviews or certain frameworks. But everyone's acting in the best of their logical capacity. No one's going to be logical, right? There's a reason behind it. It's just that you at this point with your frame of mind aren't able to tap into it. And the hack there is the curiosity element, which is beautiful because when you lead with confidence, but you don't have clarity, it could be very dangerous. But when you lead with curiosity, and then, you know, you also get the other person involved because sometimes people would like to share what they know or how they see the world. Most of the times they don't get the chance to because no one is curious enough. So I love that, you know, you put that curiosity thing. And this, honestly, for me, I can already imagine myself in the future looking at things so much more differently just with that whole curiosity mindset. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Now, you mentioned about, um, you know, how would you want to, how you want people to talk about someone in their funeral or how would that end of the life be? And a lot of experts actually say this, you should imagine your, yourself right till the end of your life and then see what's going on there and then kind of bring in those values, those concepts. Um, I always tell people like, hey, if you have five best friends, what do you want them to say at your funeral? So I'll ask you that question. Let's say you have three best friends. What would ideally you like them to say at your funeral? I think Jonathan the, was. Yeah. That's no, I lived a better life because of Jonathan and the number of people I saw him impact mm -hmm. and the number of people who I've been able to impact because mm -hmm. of the things that I learned through our relationship have made my world better and I know have made the world better for people he never met. Mm -hmm. How much time in the day do you spend thinking about this and what kind of actions do you take for yourself to kind of go back uh, and fall into this? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, let's be honest, we all live, you know, uh, fluctuating organic lives. So I don't think it's a certain amount of time every day, but mm -hmm. I probably spend one to two hours a day on average, uh, you know, thinking about some of these topics. And that's separate from in my coaching, consulting, and speaking when I'm actually directly addressing them. 
but whether it's putting together social media posts, whether it's appearing on podcasts, whether it's working on a book manuscript, like I spend time thinking about these things and I talk to people about these things because I think they're what matter. And that if all of us actually were in touch with what were our own authentic values and were willing to show up that way and not get trapped by should I, shouldn't I, how will this be received? Then I think we, you know, really address so many of the underlying causes of conflict and strife in the world, which are around insecurities and insecurity with myself, insecurity with my abilities, insecurity and in how I'm perceived. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about these things and really considering different ways of thinking about it. What are different stories that I hear from others that like, you know, inform how I think and mm -hmm. may help me explain it to others better. Mm -hmm. When you talk about insecurities, do you think most people don't turn up the way they should or they authentically want to? Is it because of insecurities or judgments? Like they're afraid of like some of the judgments or it could also be that they're afraid of judgment. That's why they're insecure. But do you see this? Um, do you see this as a common pattern in the people you coach and the people you meet? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the last thing you said is right, because if I'm going to be judged, but I don't care, then there's no insecurity, right? So what are the things we're really comfortable and confident in? You know, there isn't an insecurity about it, even if it's judged. That's not to say that, you know, we like being judged. For a lot of people, that's uncomfortable for different reasons. But I think it has to do with, you know, we all want acceptance. And as a general dynamic, you know, you cannot be accepted if you're being judged. And so, you know, what are the things that we feel we're being judged on is a threat to being accepted. And that's where the insecurity comes in. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned about confidence. Um, what's your favorite hack to build confidence? Yeah, so uh, Heather Koros has a beautiful model. She talks about comfortable confidence. And the first time I heard it, I was so annoyed with myself that I hadn't thought of the terminology myself first, <laughs> because it's this idea that it's not too many times when we talk to people about what is someone confident like, the descriptions we get are really more around arrogance. And, you know, that's not really confidence. Confidence is I'm secure in what I have and how I'm showing up. And therefore, it doesn't really matter to me how anyone else perceives me or not, how this comes across. And so I think the number one thing as far as confidence is just being really in tune with how is it I want to show up and is every way I'm presenting myself really aligned with this? Am I really acting in a way that everything I'm saying and doing is really resonant with what matters to me? Because if it is, it may or may not be right for someone else but that doesn't make it less right for me. And I can be confident in that. Okay, that's beautiful. Now, all around the world, right? We spoke about different cultures moving around, but also remote working and this gig economy has become such a big thing. Um, you yourself are traveling. I'm traveling sometimes. Now, right now I'm in Dubai, but we have so much of access in the world and technology is doing great. What are some of the things like um, skills or mindset or frameworks, do you think that will be helpful for people in the future from now? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. Obviously, some of the you know rapidly advancing technologies uh, have some huge advantages. At the same time, there's this innate need for connection. Uh, that's just part of, you know, at the biological species level. And so let's not get so caught up in what are the possibilities and just using technologies just because they exist. Exploring them to see what the possibilities are, great. But the way I always look at things are, you know, does this help me do something that I'm already doing better? Great. And does this allow me to do something I can't do already, but that I want to? Okay, great. But if not, fine, explore those things. But if it's not, don't adopt things just because they exist, because that's how we, again, move away from authenticity. What are the things that matter to me? 
So anything that helps me do that better or in a way I couldn't before, fantastic. And that isn't a right or wrong in any universal sense. It's different for every person, but really, you know, give yourself the chance to figure out what those things are for you. And the other piece that goes, I think, hand in hand with that is every situation in life offers opportunities and constraints. And it's a duality. It's not it's good or bad. It's there's opportunities and constraints. And so look at those things honestly. If I'm adopting this technology, if I'm living in this location, if I'm nomadic versus in one place, what are the opportunities that presents? What are the constraints that presents? And then figure out what balance of those is really the most aligned with the life you want to live. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. We're coming to the end of our podcast and I I wish we had more time because we can, maybe we'll do a second part on this um, sometime later. But my final question to you is if you could go back in time, let's say I gifted you a flying machine or a time machine rather, and you could go back into your younger uh, life and you could give yourself one piece of advice, what would that be? Yeah, it's funny because earlier you had mentioned you wish you'd known some of these things I was sharing when you were younger. I wish I'd known some of these things when I was younger. Um, and so if I could only take one of them, it would really be the most simple one, which is mm -hmm. how do I want to be? Because I think I fell prey when I was younger to a lot of those external measures. And, you know, I left my undergraduate college with, you know, a really great, you know, CV of activities and accomplishments, but I never really explored the things that I think would have been the most meaningful to me if I hadn't felt that pressure or internalized it from different sources and going through relationships in, you know, my younger adulthood, I had these models of how things should be versus how did I want to be? And so if I could give myself one piece of advice, it would be to really ask myself and explore that question. How do I want to be, whether in this setting, this relationship, this very interaction, and try and live as authentically close to that as I could. Thank you for sharing that, Jonathan. You're a wealth of knowledge, experience, wisdom, and just, you know, we're not close by, but I have this such beautiful vibes from you. It's like a resonant vibe, which I don't get quite often. So thank you for doing this today. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for sharing all of this. Um, you know, you've been doing great work and I highly encourage people to connect with you. What's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, the absolute easiest way is just steps to chat.com mm -hmm. and hop on my schedule. Totally complimentary, 30 minute uh, chance to chat, no strings attached. I just think there's value in the world when we connect with each other. And again, shifting from that idea of external where ROI is about, you know, return on investment. If I focus on the internal, it's ripples of impact. And so I like to have ripples on other people's lives. It goes back to what you'd said. What would I hope friends would say about me at my, you know, obituary? And I also you know, receive ripples from talking to others and getting new ideas. So mm -hmm. totally free 30 minute consultation chat. If I make sense to work with as a coach, speaker, consultant in the future, great. If I don't equally fine, we're not all resonant with each other. Um, you know, you don't try and marry every single person you date and that's okay. There's still value in all of the experiences along the way. So steps to chat.com schedule 30 minutes, happy to chat with you and uh, go from there. Amazing. I love that analogy. You don't marry everyone that you date. <laughs> that's that's uh, good to close on a light heart. And yes, everyone, please, if you can, um, and you're looking for some advice, someone who can look at life from a different frame and share with you his um, experience, go to the website, chat with him. Jonathan, thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate you. And uh, thank you for doing what you're doing, man. Absolutely. My pleasure, CJ. Thanks so much for having me on and uh, look forward to continuing the connection. And uh, I feel the resonance as well, my brother. Amazing. Amazing. And I'm going to steal what you said. Now, every time I go into a business group meeting and people talk about ROI, 
I'm going to talk the other ROI. <laughs> Ripples of impact, everyone. That's your word for today. And this is me, CJ, signing out from the Ship for CJ podcast. Everyone, have a great day, a great week, a great lifetime. And remember, today, when you go back home and you're not driving and you're not doing anything, ask yourself, who do you truly want to be? And go from there. Clarity and confidence. Take your life to the next level. Take care, everybody. Peace.